Welcome to Networking Field Day. The presentation that you are about to watch from Barefoot Networks is being attended by a group of invited networking delegates who represent the community by asking questions, offering opinions, and discussing the technology that you are about to see. If you would like to see more information about this event, please go to our website, techfieldday.com, and check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash techfieldday. Okay, I am going to hand over in a moment to Dan Lonofsky, who is uh, head of engineering here at Barefoot and uh, co-founder. I've known Dan for a, for, a, for a long time, both competing <laughs> and, uh, and, and now as a colleague here. So um, one of the co-founders, but actually the last co-founder to, to join. And uh, my background was uh, I'm doing data center equipment for probably 30 uh, some odd years, both on the compute side. I worked for a son in SGI. And then you know, as that sort of changed into Wintel in the 90s, moved over to networking. And as Nick mentioned, competed with him um, at Growth Networks, which was acquired by Cisco. Spent some time at Cisco, left and joined Google for a while. Uh, joined a company you might have heard in Wova Systems, which got Cisco into the computing business as well as all their data center switches. That was acquired back by Cisco. Spent some time there. Uh, so overall, 14 years doing stuff at Cisco, more or less, uh, as a VP and SVP. But the, uh, the most relevant thing to this was I built NPUs there. Uh, the, the heart of the CRS-1 is a big NPU. I built fixed uh, designs, which were at the heart of the Nuova switches. And you know, you've heard a lot of stuff here about you know, the concept. And to, I, I get some of the questions here. It's kind of what a lot of people react the first time. It's like, eh, there's got to be a hook here. It's too good to be true, right? Uh, something's funny. And I spent some time really talking to these guys and, and trying to understand the research they had done at Stanford to say, is this real? You know, can you really do this? And I think the combination of the PISA architecture and actually bringing compiler technology into the forefront with the P4 language is really what makes it possible. So the great news is, you know, all of us, at least, well, we all had to take a leap of faith uh, to that, you know, hey, we could pull this off. And I think with the credibility of, of the Martin and Pat from TI, Nick from Stanford and so forth, uh, you know, I bought into it. And, and the good news is, you know, after about three years, we are actually here. You know, this is it. The ship has now, you know, been fabricated. It's here. And, you know, the amazing thing is not only is it, you know, uh, a quite an accomplishment to do something like this, but it's, it's actually the world's fastest Ethernet switch. You know, not just programmable, but fastest, period, right? All switches out there, 6.5 terabits. It is the only ethernet switch that has a fully programmable pipeline. Some have made some ways to program it, but this is fully programmable in the piece of fashion. And again, it's programmable in a high level language, a high level domain specific language P4, which means that, you know, it's not just microcoders that, you know, you, 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 you know, can, can make modifications and get it to you again. Even then it would be six months if somebody wanted some new feature in, a, in an NPU, let's say, you can actually do this uh, in a high level language. And again, when the piece of architecture is implemented, I'm going to show you some more details on this, you actually end up with something that doesn't have any penalty in terms of area or power or price. So, you know, it's, it's really quite revolutionary. Maybe I'll pass this along. So what does a switch look like, a single chip switch in particular, right? Generally, what you're going to have is it's going to be, and you'll see the picture I'll show you later of the die, uh, you know, media access control, max, if you will, around the outside, receive and transmit. And then the packets come in and are pro processed in an ingr ingress pipeline. And that's usually, you know, so again, as, as Nick was showing, for this class of high performance, very high speed, a fixed pipeline. And then packets end up in a shared packet buffer of some sort. They get, you know, queued here, and then they go to the output through an egress pipeline, again, doing various rewrites, maybe adding a tunnel and cap and then through a transmit MAC. And then on the top, you have some sort of interface to the control plane, uh, usually through PCIe. Maybe you have a dedicated CPU MAC, and then hopefully you have some DMA engines to quickly, efficiently move stuff back and forth. So what's different about Tofino? Well, it's really the magic is in this pipeline. I mean, besides extremely hard, I should say, you know, the, we have a VLSI team in the other building. Anything of this class is extremely difficult to do. There's very few teams in the world that can pull this kind of stuff off. But you take that base of that type of, of BLSI design and then you add 
the piece of architecture. Basically, this match action units replicate them, as Nick had indicated, and you end up with um, the, the Tofino architecture, right? So just diving down to the next level of detail, this is an actual chip. It's actually a plot. If it was a photo, you wouldn't be able to see anything. It's too, it's too small, too many layers of metal. But what you really see here is you've got the max around the outside. So there's 260 of those. You've got your four replicated pipelines. I, I didn't point that out in the previous picture, just for total throughput reasons that, that usually gets replicated. Now in our case, I th showed the ingress and egress on opposite sides. In reality, we fold it together and actually, that's another degree of programmability. You can balance between how much ingress and egress uh, pipeline you want. In fact, you can bypass the whole egress pipeline if you want for minimum latency, and some people do that. So, uh, and then you have this packet buffer in the middle, and it, obviously everything has to go in and everything has to come out. So this in itself is a, quite the feed, 12.8 terabits of bandwidth in and out of that, that shared memory. So just to give you, again, a recap, flexible port configurations. Again, 100 gig is kind of the state of the art. That's what the, the unit of measure here. But you can also downshift and use two lanes to get 130 ports of 50 gig, 260 ports of 25 gig. And if you really, legacy, if you will, in this world is, is 40 gig and 10 gig. So those are the, the legacy interfaces, if you will. Our CPU interface, because this is a high performance programmable design, you want to be able to have a very high performance host interface because you may not just put a CPU there. You might go to another level of NPU actually to do more processing on a subset of the packets. So we put a Gen 3 uh, PCIe interface, the state of the art, by four uh, possible, uh, capable, and also 100 gig just to the CPU, which would take a big honking Xeon to really use, but somebody might put that uh, next to it, again, in a, in a sort of more specialized networking application. Um, now, the, the, the MAU pipelines themselves, the real magic, and this is where Pat comes in, they are, there's four pipelines of 12 stages each. So these, this section of the logic in the four corners there are identical. And really the way it's designed is what we call a structured design. It's very much like you would, somebody like NVIDIA for GPUs or Intel for their CPUs would do. It's very regular design. It's not just uh, handed to a, a tool that automatically places and routes. It's, it's really uh, hand laid out and tiled in such a way that you get the efficiencies that you get on those type of designs. And that's part of the, the magic of what Nick was saying in terms of no area penalty. When you do it that way, the extra flexibility you need to actually put crossbars in so that you can do up any lookup you want and get the results and manipulate them is taken care of because you've managed the wires and you get this very efficient uh, unit and then you replicate it in our case 48 times. So the design itself is implemented in the latest technology, which is 16 nanometer FinFET, uses 12 layers of metal. There's over 12 and a half billion transistors in this design. It's huge, right? Uh, I'm amazed actually that anything can be fabricated like this, but we get pretty good yields on this. And uh, 22 megabytes of shared packet buffer, and again, 260 25 gigabit per second surveys. So 16 nanometer FinFET is fairly conventional. You're not using magic technology here, is that right? <laughs> no, it's not magic, no. It's, it's not it, like the new Intel CPUs, which are... You well, know, they're, in, they're in 10, Yeah. Uh, even though they're not shipping that yet. That's yeah, what I'm yeah. saying. This is the latest that's in production today is 16. That's practical production mode, your technology. Yeah, your, your iPhone 7 is, six, is this, this technology. Yeah, so well known. Either from TSMC or Samsung. And so there's no reason to assume that your production would be delayed by production problems. Oh, no, no, yeah, no. I mean, like I say, if, it, if it's in your iPhone 7, <laughs> it's shipped in <laughs> quantity, right? <laughs> so, no, no, we, we've, we've, again, we've uh, seen enough data on the yields that uh, that's not going to be an issue. I mean, this is not a cheap piece of silicon, I'll tell you that much, right? No, it's a, no. a lot bigger than what's in your, any kind of cell phone you're carrying. But, yeah, I'm thinking more about uh, the it, mechanics it, of the TSMC production process is pretty well ironed out. And the, they, they are shipping tens of thousands of wafers a month yep. in this technology. Vanilla standard. Yep. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. There's yep, no, exo point, there's no or, exotic yeah. silicon germanium or yeah. you know optical magic. Chelsea, Chelsea conoids or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, no, about. again, I think that the, the real trick is again, if we go back to those other pictures, was to realize that we haven't changed the whole thing. We've only changed the pieces that are forwarding. Yep. And those forwarding pieces, because that we've spent a lot of time looking at the and making them very regular. Yep. They can be efficiently laid out and, mm -hmm. and take no more area than the the random logic that you end up when you're trying to you know do two dozen different protocols 
and, and you let the tools just... Yeah, I'm, I was I'm, more, I'm more commenting on the sense of a, the production velocity. Yeah. Well, a lot of the times we have vendors come along and say, you know, we're announcing this now and it'll be shipping futures. No, you know, it's shipping it, it, this year. Yeah. I mean, you but know, that's why, because your production today, process but, is, is right. viable. Yeah. yeah, it's very viable. A quick question about um, the speed just on, you know, how you qualify the speed is, you know, vendor X comes back to you guys and say, well, you're not the fastest, you know, we're the fastest. Is this kind of like in the context of disaggregation because it's single switch, single chip, and no, vendor I mean, X I, I know all, comes yeah, back, I but know. they say our chassis does 12 terabits. I'm just curious how you, how you qualify the statement. You know, if somebody were to come back and say, no, that's not faster, this is faster, just where that well, derives from. I think we know all the, all the people out there. And yeah. We, and yeah, the, 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 the biggest guy in this space, in the merchant space, their biggest is is 6.4. Okay. So you know they didn't put a 100 gig CPU pipe on it. So they're close, but they're right. smaller. And you know the next one down that I'm aware of is from Cisco, which is a 3.6. Okay. So you know I'm sure they'll be passed up. You know we're obviously the, we're keeping people busy working on our next gen as well. But mm. but you know this is the fastest that exists in the world today. Cool. And like I said, the magic is it's programmable. It's not just the fastest. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I've talked about the 6.5T, right? You can imagine people using this in very high-performance data centers uh, at various levels, uh, in particular in the, the kind of leaf and spine, probably more in the spine level if you're using it for, for 6,500 gig ports. But some people are pushing now to 50 gig to the server, so you might have a mix of 150 going to servers. We also have a version, that, because it's very regular, we can do cut-downs of the version, just like the Intel does, you know, 8-core, 6-core, whatever it's... It's really the same die, they just, you know, some parts don't work. So this is the same thing. We can do two pipes and get you a half band with 3.3 terabit. Then there's these other configurations which are really subsetting, specialized for, for different places in the network, more access. And this one, if you, if you wanted your programmability but wanted to get it at, at for more 10 and 40 gig configurations. So anywhere from 6.5 to 1.9T will be uh, shipping this year. And of course, if we just supplied the raw hardware, that'd be nice, but every, our customers would have to do a lot of work to turn it into real switches, right? So we've done more than that. The team is really about half software, half hardware. And the software part, I think Nick alluded to this a little bit, we've authored our own switch.p4, which is actually open sourced. You can get it from p4.org. That basically has, well, I'll go, I'll go to it in a second. Basically, all the standard functions and then some that you'd get in anybody's switch today. We've created a compiler we call Capilano, which takes that P4 description and creates a configuration that then is loaded into uh, one of those Tofino chips. This is just a, a high level idea of, of what's in it. It's an I chart, I understand, but L2, L3, you have, somebody mentioned V6, yeah, there's V6 support. You've got VXLAN tunnels, NVGRE, even with the new things like Geneve uh, and so forth. There's uh, VLAX. VXLAN routing and uh, other features. We have this very nice feature called negative mirroring. So if you're gonna drop a packet, like Nick was talking about Insight, you can actually ship it out a, a mirror port instead so you can understand what was dropped. And even other interesting things like offload, protocol offload, like BFD and other OAM type features. So this is just available, right? So you get our chip, you get this, you get the libraries above it. You basically have the standard of what people can get from a merchant chip, you know, a fixed chip, but you can then change it, right, with the tools of the compiler. So, like, if I want to add EVPN to your list of you know features there, that's something that you just forklift in. Sorry, I didn't e EVPN. Like, if I want to add EVPN as yeah. a protocol, that's something yes. you just forklift in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and in fact, you'll hear about that shortly. You know, oh, that's, awesome. a, great. that's a great question. Let me to skip ahead. It's a great <laughs> question. Right. So, so you know, there's a set of tools here, right? So there's a compiler, the Capilano I mentioned. Oh. Then there's debugging tools. This is the graph visualizer tool that shows you what you've actually defined in your system and you can even tell you what you've actually executed you're trying to simulate for correctness. And then there's visualizers, because there is a fixed amount of hardware here. So like was asked before, you know, what happens if you do too much? Well, you run out of space, either your SRAM or your TCAM lookups. Okay, so, so it's really these two things. And, and Ed is gonna also tell you about the switches we've actually developed here, because again, I'm kind of from Cisco, so I like to <laughs> develop boxes, not just chips, but, but these are uh, the two switches we have. So again, we're the world's fastest, the world's fully, first fully programmable, the first programmable in a high level language, and we give you this with no penalty for power or performance. And it's real, I mean, it's, there's no black magic here. You, you, you'll see the, the demos coming up. And again, it's from a total offering, there's software as well, the open source switch.p4, 
and we have the drivers and libraries to create the whole SDK. And then again, a compiler and SDE environment to give you either, you know, you can do something as simple as just reallocate the resources, like we said. You know, we want a bigger V6 table, smaller V4, you want uh, more ACLs, you can do that. Or you can customize the switch.p4, or you can start from scratch and, and, and write something of your, you know, dedicated to you. And people are doing all three of these.